can we gather as a people? You know, we thank you for the privilege of being counted as yours. And God, as we look into this passage this morning, look at a passage of great joy and hope, Lord, would you through it bring relief for those who are in seasons of prolonged darkness? God, would it provide direction for those who fear your name? And God, would it provide correction for the wayward? God, if you do not move, if your spirit does not apply this text, anything that is said by man will fall and will fail to accomplish anything. And so God, we do not lean on the skill of men, but we lean on the truth of the word and the power of God. That we would hear this word, that we would respond to this word in faith and obedience. That those who know you would grow in the discipline of the Lord, and those that do not would come to know. And God, make your Son known to us this morning. Make your will known to us this morning. For God, we seek your glory, not ours. Amen. We have been in Malachi eight weeks as of today, and this is the final week in Malachi. Again, I wanted to pause from Matthew and, and take a little short walk, a little jaunt through this book. Malachi usually gets known for one verse in Malachi, and the rest is all forgotten, but we've, we've taken the time to look at the entirety of it, what it means to, to taste and feast on this. And, and Malachi overall, like a lot of prophets, just heavy, really, really heavy to, to deal with. There's a lot of, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. But Malachi leaves us, the prophet Malachi, and this word leaves us in this letter, but also in its placement, the Old Testament, it leaves us with a hopeful outlook for that which is to come. But we need to have serious and sober conversations. We need to have funeral conversations, if you will. We also need to have wedding conversations, uh, conversations of celebration and delight and joy. And then Malachi leaves us with a looking forward, with an anticipation for something to come. It leaves us at the very end of Malachi waiting for the true messenger. Malachi means my messenger, but we're waiting for the true messenger. It talks about this spirit of Elijah, this prophet Elijah who's going to come, but we know that even the prophet Elijah is not who we're really waiting for, but we're waiting for someone to come. And from the vantage point of Malachi, contemporaries of Nehemiah and Ezra, contemporaries with those who were rebuilding Jerusalem after the complete destruction and then the exile and then the 70, year, 70 years wait outside of the land and then the return, here they are seeing things being rebuilt, but at the end of the day, they still live among the ruins. At the end of the day, they still have a foreign king who is over them, and so the people of Israel are in sin in general, but yet Malachi leaves them with those who fear the Lord. There is something to look forward to. You are not going to be abandoned. You're not going to be forsaken. Yes, we are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Yes, we are rebuilding the temple. But God is going to rebuild Israel. God is going to rebuild his people. We are not just going to be some blot on the line of history, but we are going to be part of something that is amazing. And it leaves us, what is that? What is it? And for the 400, 500 years after this, it was, God, when are you going to come? 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 When are you going to come and do this thing? But God really went dark after this season. There really was no word from God after the season. There was no sign of anything. And then that prophecy from Isaiah rings out again in the early Gospels where it says, A light shone in the darkness. After a season of great darkness, light shone. And so this is, if you will, the last light before the darkness. It's, it's the last waypoint. 
It's the last time they had instructions of what was going to happen. I don't know if you've ever been driving with GPS, but sometimes your GPS loses signal and you no longer know exactly where you're at. So you're basing it off of your last point. All right, the map said I was here and I'm supposed to end up there. I'm just gonna go with what I think I know. And, and you have to go a little bit beyond the screen. So you can't even tell if you're roughly there. You just, well, Lord, I have no signal. I, I hope I land where I'm supposed to be, but until I'm there, I'm gonna go with the last instructions I received and go in this direction. And that's what Malachi leaves us with in a sense of, of the story of scripture. Go with the last instructions you receive and then tell the return of God, tell the communication of God, the word of God comes and reveals himself again. Go with what you know, what you have been told, what you've been taught. And so this is what we see and we, we hear this. But what we're going to see in this text expanded, and what I'm going to point out is that the day of the Lord is a terror to the wicked and a delight or a delightful relief to the righteous. You need to understand that Malachi leaves Israel looking for the day of the Lord. Like many prophets do. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, that day, that great day, the day of terror, the great, the great day when God comes to judge. And this is the light that goes up, but we're waiting for the day of the Lord. So it was appropriate for the early church to think that when Christ came, he was going to judge then and well, then and at the same time, and as well as coming, they thought he was going to judge. So they were a little bit set off foot when it asked. They say, is it now when you will establish the kingdom? All right, so you died. We weren't expecting that. You rose from the grave. We really weren't expecting that, but we're glad you did. So is now the time when you will establish your kingdom? And Jesus says, oh, you little fakers. You guys just still don't get it. Just wait. And like, but we've been waiting for hundreds of years. We've been waiting, and what do you mean wait? And so they, even then, they're left waiting for something, but they're, they're waiting for the rest of the day of the Lord. We learn from the New Testament that the day of the Lord is not just, if you will, a single day. And we, and we go back in light of the New Testament, read the Old Testament, and understand the day of the Lord is not just a single 24-hour day, although it includes that, but it in includes the idea, if your grandfather might have ever said, well, back in my day, he wasn't referencing March 20th of, you know, 1959. He was referencing that era, that time, that season. And so when we are waiting for the day of the Lord, but yes, we're waiting for particular, real, tangible events, but it's not crammed into a 24-hour period. But in fact, the day of the Lord began at Pentecost. It says in the day of the Lord that God will pour out his spirit on his people, and that happened at Pentecost. But we are still in the day of the Lord, and we're still waiting for the day of the Lord. So let's, let's consider this text, that the day of the Lord is a terror to the wicked, and it is a delight to the righteous. And it says, for behold, the day is coming, and burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. And again, the day, that day, that is coming shall set them ablaze, who, the arrogant and the evildoers, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Just in this first verse, this day of the Lord is certainly a terror of judgment for those who do not fear the Lord. For those who are arrogant, the evildoers, let's consider Mal Malachi again in its entirety. The very beginning, it begins with Israel, and it addresses Israel in those few, first few verses. It says, Israel, I have loved you. And it says, well, how have you loved us? It says, well, it is not Esau, Jacob's brother, but Esau hated but Jacob I love. And it begins speaking to all Israel. But then the next section of Malachi, it changes from focusing on Israel, and it addresses the priests. It says, priests, you've done messed up. You have fouled up and made a fool of yourselves. You have made a disgrace of the covenant made with Levi. And so he addresses the, the, the priests those who are Levites, who have the responsibility of ensuring that the people of God worship God properly, who have the responsibility of ensuring that the people of God were instructed accurately. You need to understand, 
And that in the day of the Lord, the day when we stand before God, we will all be held accountable for what we did. But there is a distinction between me and between you. Not because I'm more important, but because of the, the responsibility I've been given. I am going to be held to a higher standard before God because I have been tasked with the responsibility of teaching you what God says. So you, to a degree, can say, well, my pastor didn't tell me. And to a degree, that will work. And God will say, well, I will account for that. But at the end of the day, God will still hold you accountable. But we see in Malachi that the first people that God addresses, that Malachi addresses, the prophet of God, is the priests. Those who were specifically tasked with teaching the people of God. And we are a kingdom of priests that they hold, but I still have that particular office. And so those who hold that office, that responsibility, but this plays out in other domains as well. Father, you are going to be held differently in regards to responsibility of your family than your wife is. Parents are going to be held to a higher standard than their children are. That there's a responsibility relationship of those who are put in a particular office or position to care for them. Distributing and the communicating of the word of God. Is it done right? Is it done well? And so the priests did not do it right. They did not do it well. And in fact, they had taught the people of God, you know what? God just kind of started this motor up and he went on vacation, so we can do whatever we want. And so it wasn't just the priests weren't doing it well, they were doing it to the opposite. They were doing it quite wrong. But then it turns and starts addressing the people of God, of Israel. It turns from the priests and turns to the people of God as well. It says, all right, well, you all need to hear this. And it goes in and begins explaining what's going on, and, and that's where it includes that famous passage, you were robbing God. But it also includes that delightful passage. Because I do not change, you, O Israel, are not consumed. Because God does not change, you are not consumed. So even though the priests are knuckleheads, and even though you are belligerent, because God does not change, you are not soaked up in a flood of fire in an instant. But instead, you are given grace and mercy. And God says, I will be patient with you. And so there's this reward. And then it, then it ends in chapter 3 with this third group of people. We have, well, so we said at the beginning of Israel, then we have the priests, but then we have the people of God. But it ends this third group of people. Those who fear the Lord. And that was our sermon, or the, the text we had for the sermon last week. Those who fear the Lord. And what a delight and encouragement that is. I remember that the, the quote we heard that you are afraid of disobeying and you are afraid of losing him. It's a beautiful, beautiful fear. It's not the fear of the boogeyman. The only person we are commanded to fear in all of Scripture is God Himself. And in fact, we are told to not fear anyone or anything else, but only God Himself. It says that this day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubbled. The day is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. We live in humble. And whether we live in the city or we live in the county, we at least are aware of those little fires that we see in the forest on the wet days. The little smokestacks that are coming up. For people who are not taking their trash to the dump are actually burning up their trash in their yard. They're getting rid of all of the foliage, the, the leftovers from the garden, or perhaps just trash for a period of time, or, or a project that they're cleaning up, old wood, and they're just burning it up. And I've seen those piles of trash that have been burned up, and you know what the owners or the landowners do? They ensure that it is entirely burned they consume every square inch of that trash. Why? Because it is just that trash. Useless. A waste of space. And that's just wood. That's just roots. That's just leftover garden. That's just leftover paper that you don't need anymore. How much more will the wrath of God completely and entirely consume those who rebel against him? I've never met someone who burned up trash and was in anger towards that trash. I hate you people for it. Amen.
yet the wrath that comes out towards those who do not believe will be certain and sure and permanent and eternal. You see, the fires in the yard in the county go out after 24 hours or so. But what do we read? That the fires of eternity do not go out. If you would, turn with me, and we see this judgment played out in Matthew 25. And this is a a fairly famous parable in one hand, yet at the same time, it's a prophecy. And it says in Matthew 25, and I'm going to read at length, it says, it says in 25 verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, almost dumbfounded if you will, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers. Imagine, if you will, the Lord Jesus pointing to the sheep. When you did it to one of these, the least of these even, when you did it to the one who is most insignificant, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, earlier eternal fire, now known as eternal punishment. But the righteous, the righteous into eternal life. To the degree that salvation is eternal is to the degree that judgment is eternal. In the day of the Lord, we will see judgment, but we will see reward. Consider, if you will, in verse 2 of of Malachi chapter 4, but for you who fear my name, the Son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Again, this day being a day of judgment and a day of reward, as we saw in the previous uh, week in Malachi chapter 3 verse 18, then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. When we stand before God, he's going to make a distinction. And as we saw last week, but I remind us again this week and remind us often, the distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous is not in what you do. And you're like, wait, but Matthew 25 just says in in what we did, Yes, it's in what you do, but it's not in what you do in the sense of, I'm going to do this and earn my way to heaven, but it's in the sense of what you do in response to Christ. Who is Christ? We do not avert the day of judgment. It cannot be stopped. I want you to go out and use a popsicle stick to stop a Mack truck. And you're like, well, that's dumb. No one would do that. All right, well, stopping the day of judgment... That's child's play. I want you to go out and blow bubbles so that you can help a 747 Boeing airplane stop safely on the runway. Again, impossible. Not going to happen. The day of the Lord, the day of his great coming is coming. And the only way that we will survive that 
The only way that we will come and come out of that unscathed is not based off of what you did, but based off of who you responded to. When you stand before the Lord, is it, look at me and what I did? Or when you stand before the Lord, it will be, Lord, I do not belong, but look at what you did. Don't look to me. Look to your son. You need to understand, we have destroyed every law of God. I don't have to push too hard to do this. And I don't have to push too hard to demonstrate that we have all broken the law of God and that even if we don't believe that, I don't even have to push even that hard to demonstrate we don't even follow our own rules. Watch a group of kids who make up rules to a new game of tag, and every 16 seconds they're making up a new rule because someone else isn't winning the way they want to win, so they make up a new rule so that they can win. Well, you just broke your rule. Well, it's okay for me to do that because, you know, I'm better than you. We, we, we make up our own rules. We make up our own standards, and, and God says, no, there is only one standard. There's only one standard, and, and, and what do we even see? We see it in verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember what I commanded you to do. Do it. Israel could not do it. Israel could not obey the law, and that's where we cling to Christ when he says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think I've come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. It is still wrong to sin. It, it is still wrong and evil to break the law of God. Although the law of God is not encapsulated in the Mosaic law in the sense of, well, now we obey the Mosaic law, but it's encapsulated in who God is. Anything that is an affront, anything that is in opposition, anything that attempts to remove from God and apply to self is sin. Anything that is in contrast with who God is is sin. And so we have the law, if you will, encapsulated in the Mosaic law, often distilled down to the Ten Commandments. But when we live in opposition to God in any sphere or domain, what is the judgment? Death. Death. That's, that's the only judgment. If you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. Well, they didn't die. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. They did die. But what do we see? The fact that they didn't die immediately is not that God lied, but God was gracious in that moment to not immediately condemn them to death. Because I, the Lord, do not change. You are not consumed, O people of God. You are not consumed. You and I should be dead already. And some of you are like, yeah, I've lived a rough life. No, no. You and I have disobeyed the living, loving, perfect, holy, majestic God. We deserve death right now, and yet God says, look, you respond to my son, and something beautiful is going to happen. You will rise from the dead. Not in this weird, mystical, Caribbean island walking on coal fires, but you're going to walk on the ashes. You are going to walk on the graves of the dead. We are who claim Christ we are dead men walking. We are dead men walking. We deserve death, and yet we have been given life. And it says, who? Those who fear the name of the Lord, the Son of righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go forth leaping like calves from the stall. You're no longer going to be held down to the despair and darkness and sorrow of this life, but even the darkest day of this life does not compare does not even compare to hell. And when we consider heaven, the darkest day of this life is easy. And I say that carefully because I understand and I know you guys, I know that some of you have very dark days, but when we see the king in his glory, our dark days will seem like nothing. Like, why did I worry about such a small thing? And I'm not trying to be trite or simplistic of very difficult things. But if Christ could count his murder as a joy set before him, then consider your greatest pain as a smaller joy set before you, only to receive the inheritance promised and secured in eternity for you. 
But our response to the gospel, our response to the good news of, of salvation through Christ for those who believe in him and say, you are my only hope, Christ, the response is not apathy. The response is not go do what you want. The response is not, well, now that I have insurance, I can drive recklessly. If you would, if any of you were foolish enough to break your grandmother's fine china, her most prized dish in the house or something, if any of you were foolish enough to break it, and you just broke, and your grandma says, I forgive you. And you say, you know what, I am going to walk in this forgiveness. And you walk in that forgiveness into the kitchen and you begin breaking other stuff. She is going to say, what is wrong with you? And you say, well, you forgave me, and I'm walking in that forgiveness. Your grandma will have a few other words for you and a few other options for you, but we would all say, well, that, that's just a dumb decision. We would not live that way. If our grandmother forgave us for breaking something treasured to her, what would we do? We would endeavor, we would seek to never break another thing of hers again. Why? Because we love our grandmother. If this is true of an earthly pitcher, how much more is it true of the eternal pitcher? If God has saved you from salvation, if God has brought you from death, why would we think, you know, I don't want to be legalistic? You know, I'm just going to live by the Spirit, and I'm not going to worry about obeying God, because He forgives me for whatever I do. Pre-planned grace is not pre-planned grace. Pre-planned grace is abuse of the divine gift of God. We don't abuse such a beautiful thing entrusted to us. We are stewards of the grace of God. Let us treat that grace like it is the most precious thing that we have ever owned. Let us treat that grace of salvation and new life and eternal life as the delightful and the caring, and the simple thing that it is. Not simple and stupid, but just, it's so simple, yet it's so beautiful. Our response to the day of judgment is to repent and believe. Our response is to obey the word of God. Our response is, even in this text, look, it says, is to look up to look forward. It says in verse 5, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. There is a day coming. There is a day coming from the vantage point of Malachi when Elijah the prophet, the great prophet Elijah, outdone only by Elisha, who had a double portion of Elijah's spirit, he is going to come and prepare the way for the king. For the king. We wait for things. And we don't just wait for things, but we wait for signs of things. When you come home, a lot of us travel the 101, you don't just wait for your house off the 101. What do you wait for? You wait for your off-ramp. I'm looking for off-ramp 600 or whatever. Or I'm waiting for field landing. Or I'm waiting for 12th Street. Or I'm waiting for whichever off-ramp is mine. What, what's my off-ramp? I'm waiting for that because that lets me know that home is close. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. That's what the prophet Elijah is. He's letting people know, you're almost there. Something important is coming. And for those who fear the Lord, delight. But those who reject the Lord, terror. Terror. Look up. What does it say? He's going to send the prophet. Prophet Elijah. If, or if you will, turn with me to Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 3, Verses 1 through 12, it, it explains more fully what's going on with John, and I'm just going to kind of cherry pick some thoughts through here. But in, in Matthew chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and what is his message? 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what is the first message of Jesus? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We cannot read that message outside of the context of Malachi and and get what it means. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand is the day of the Lord is here. There are those who will burn, and there are those who will see the Son of Righteousness rise on the wings with healing. So repent, turn from That is the same message as Malachi and the rest of the prophets. And what does it say? It says, the the Isaiah has this. It says, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. What is the prophet Elijah supposed to be doing? He is supposed to be preparing the way of the Lord, declaring the Lord is at hand. The Lord is coming. He is bringing his kingdom. And it says even in verse 8, what does it say? It says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not enough just to repent, to turn from your sins and turn to Christ, but now live like it. No, don't just say, I'm a Christian, but now actually live like it. It's not enough to say, well, I got the merit badge, yeah, but you know nothing about it. You know nothing about what it means. And it, well, how can you say that? That's mean. Your life says it. I'm simply reading the book. And again, it says even in verse 10, even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Christian, if you are not bearing good fruit, you need to take stock of your life. If you look at your life and just take stock and say, does my life look more or less like what God has called me to? And I'm not saying perfection here. Don't misunderstand me. But if in this week you can't see anything that is demonstrably a result of Christ being in your life, you should review the passage on repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I had a pastor tell me, it was actually the pastor, two pastors of this church ago, I met him before he died in his late 80s or early 90s, and he says, you know what, you need to evangelize. And a great place to start is in the pew. Because honestly, many people come to church week in, week out, week in, week out. And we think, we know it, we know the Bible stories and we fool ourselves. And you're like, well, I'm, no, no, I'm not one of those. You do realize all of Malachi was written to a nation of people who thought they knew. To priests who thought they knew. The priest could outquote scripture any day of the week over you. What does Jesus say? If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes. A warning. Brother and sister, check for fruit in your life. Check to see, does my life produce fruit in keeping with repentance? And then John the Baptist goes on as he's preparing the way. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, meaning he's not the one. He says, whose sandal I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Brother and sister, I want to paint a picture for you. The unbeliever will be consumed by the fire eternally. But the ashes, if I can paint a picture, upon which the righteous dance on are like the ashes of Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. Oh, it's not that the ashes were thrown onto the ground and you dance on them, but you are in the midst of it and surviving. We read in Corinthians that we are going to be tested and tried with fire. Let us not think that it's going to be easier for the believer to stand before the Lord. Oh, we are going to see the severity of the Lord and the gentleness of the Lord when we stand before him. But the difference for the believer from the unbeliever, from those who fear the Lord and those who do not, from those who serve the Lord and those who do not, is those who do will endure, but those who do not will perish. But what do we read also in Matthew chapter 11, and again, I'm not going to read it in entirety, but Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19, and here again, you have John the Baptist now in jail, hearing about Jesus, and, and John the Baptist says, hey, Jesus, are you the guy? Are you the one we're waiting for? Are you the Lord? Are you the Christ? Are, are you the one coming in the day of the Lord? And, and Jesus quotes him, and it says, you know, in verse 2, now when John heard In the deeds of the Christ, he sent words by his disciples. Are you the one to come, or shall we look for another? 
And then Jesus gives him signs to go and to be told to him. And it says in verse 7, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd saying, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A, a reed shaken in the wind? No, you didn't, go out, you didn't go to look at the grass in the desert. Or did you go out to see a man dressed in fine clothing, and soft clothing? No, you didn't go out to see kings in the desert. You go to palaces for that. He says, what did you go to see? A prophet? He says, no, you saw more than a prophet. This is the one who has written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way for you. Brother and sister, when we look at the, the prophet, the last prophet of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, we look at the one who came in the spirit of Elijah, and he said, Jesus says, if you will have it, I tell you, John is Elijah. But it was interesting, reading the Puritan TV more, he made a point talking about the day of the Lord, and he uses the phrase successive fulfillment, successive fulfillment meaning that the day of the Lord is fulfilled in more than one way. It's successively fulfilled in multiple ways. But he also takes that and he applies that idea also to the spirit, to the prophet of Elijah. That it's not just a particular prophet, if you will, but there's a successful fu fulfillment. Yes, there is a tangible real, but there's the successive fulfillment where it's not just here it is, we're looking for Elijah in the flesh, but instead we're looking for the spirit of prophecy which Elijah had, which was what? To call people to repentance. Is that you, Elijah? Oh, you troubler of Israel. It is not me who has troubled Israel, but it is you, O oh, King Ahab, you husband of Jezebel, you murderer of God's people, you worshipers of Baal. You have abandoned the living God for idols. We need to understand, consider this, that just as the first coming of the Lord, the beginning of the day of the Lord was heralded by prophets of old and was heralded by the word of God, that heralding has not ceased. Matthew 28, what does it read? Go, therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I commanded you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. We are to go as a church. Just consider this. God has given the church the task to continue that work of Elijah, that work of the warning prophet to be a prophetic voice in the community, to say, community, you need to repent or you will die. You're mean. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I talked with a man yesterday. He had to go pull his kid out of the house because the back of the house is burning. No one, no one would accuse that father of being mean stubborn, hard-headed, one way of doing things. No one would accuse that father of being narrow-minded. No one would accuse that father of anything ill except good for saying, son, you know, I'm thinking it's not a good idea if you're in this house that, you know, if things continue as they are, we'll be entirely consumed in flames. Everyone will see that father as you did the right thing. And if that son had rebelled against his father, the father would have been in the right to take the kid by the scuff of the neck and drag him out of the house. Why? Because that father has an eternal care, even as a human father has a, a real care that would drive him to save his child. Now, in this case, not a dramatic fire that the, that the child was, if you will, in danger from. But I want you to have a clear picture of the fires of hell that burn forever. And when we go and proclaim the word of God, we are not narrow-minded. We are not harsh. We are not critical. It is the most loving thing that you can do. You can do it in an unloving way. Don't get me wrong. But it is the most loving thing you can do to warn someone that if you do not repent, you are going to die. 
You're going to die. I, I love you, and I don't want you to die. God loves you. He does not desire that you would perish. This is the end of the Old Testament. God saying, I'm warning you. I'm warning you. The day of the Lord is a terror to the wicked and a delight to the righteous, a delightful relief to the righteous. There's only, or rather, let me say that differently. In light of that, there are five things that I want to just quickly move through that I think I've already made clear, but I just want to ring real quick that we ought to do in light of this text. The one is repent. Repent and believe that Jesus Christ is the one who has come to, to care for us and to save us from that fire. And not only did he save us from that fire, he himself suffered the wrath of God. He didn't just call 911. He was consumed by the wrath of God for us. Repent and believe, turn to him. And the next one, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Turn to him. I, God, I am, I am afraid of disappointing you, and I am afraid of losing you. There's nothing that would make me happier, Lord, than to be in your presence, and there is nothing that would make me more miserable than to be absent from your presence. Lord, you alone do I fear. Thirdly, hope. Hope. But you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. I know that for some of you, the healing hasn't been made evident yet. You're still waiting, if you will, for the entirety of that healing. Like a surgery that went well, yet you still have six weeks of recovery, so it is when we come to Christ, when we see him, when he pulls us through things. We've made it through the surgery, but we're still waiting for the fulfillment. We're still waiting for, for the mobility to come back. We're still waiting to be able to eat the foods that we want to eat. And so we look forward. We look to the future. We look to what we hope in. Our Redeemer coming the second time, just like he came the first time, we hope. Fourth, obey. Obey, the, just, just obey. And he was like, well, how do I obey? Just read the word. Send under the faithful preaching of the word, read the word, and find another Christian who thinks a little bit more rightly of you than you do. They will help you obey. They will help you say, you know what? Perhaps, you know, this area, you could pay attention to God a little bit better. But obey the word. Not because you want to earn salvation, but because you realize that sin was not what we were created for, not what you were created for. And you're like, I was created for more than this. We all have this longing. Now I feel like I'm just lacking something. We all have that longing. That's God designed that for us. And that longing is fulfilled by living in obedience to God, not in disobedience. And fifthly, declare, make loud, make clear, make faithful the message of salvation to a lost and dying world. Parents, this begins in the home but church family, this begins in the church body. You, you have brothers and sisters here that you can help and, and help them declare, okay, you know, how do, I, how do I tell this person about Jesus? They have that question. How do I? And, and you can work with one another and you hear the preaching of the word, you hear the scripture and you declare. You, you do it intentionally. You go and do street witnessing or you do it carefully where you say, you know, what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have someone, I'm going to take them out for coffee or for lunch or for dinner. Where I'm just going to just lay it out for them. You do it long term for the rest of my life. I am going to devote myself to taking every opportunity I can to declare the word of God to those who are around me. There's many different ways to declare the word of God. The pulpit, in a sense, may be the loudest bell, but it is certainly not the only bell. We all have a responsibility to declare the word of God. Yes, let it ring clearly from the pulpit. But let that refrain be heard all week long in the lives and in the mouths of the believer. I can think of no better way to end our time in Malachi 
than to read, if you will, a, a parallel passage, a sister passage. We have ended Malachi. We have found the end of Malachi, and we found the end of the Old Testament, left with a sober reminder of what is to come, but left with hope and something to look forward to. So let us also turn and consider Revelation in chapter 22, where it leads, if you will, with a, a similar and a melodic and a harmonic ending to this message. And it says in Revelation 22, verse 6, And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Keep does not mean in your pocket, it means obey. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, meaning don't get quiet about Jesus. Don't get quiet about his return, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Don't make the air of those in the days of Malachi to say, well, God's not doing anything, so I can do whatever I want. No, be holy, be righteous. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Again, Jesus sends a forerunner. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen? Let's pray. God, we long for the day when you will return. And in, in light of the eternity, in our youthful ignorance, and in our zealousness for your name, God, would you come not knowing even the full weight of what that will bring. We have a, a picture, an outline, a, a shaping of what it is, but God, the, the details and the fullness at this time are beyond our imagination, are beyond our description. So Lord, what you have described strikes terror and delight in us. God, those who are hear and love you, Lord, would this be a hope and a delight to consider that, Jesus, you are coming soon and your day will be made known to all. And Lord, would this be a terror for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of repentance, for the sake of turning and obeying you to those who do not fear your name, to those who scoff and laugh, for those who snub their nose, God, we ask that you would come soon. But Lord, we also ask that until you come, would you strengthen us with your spirit to remain obedient to you, faithful to you in all things. God, we long 
we long for your return. And until then, we long to obey you. Oh, Jesus, answer these prayers according to your power. Amen.